text for the sermon will be the last four verses of Ephesians 2, verses 19 through 22. We will not reread those verses, so I ask that you pay special attention to the final four verses. Ephesians 2, verse 1, And you hath he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath even as others. But God, who is rich in his mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace ye are saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Wherefore remember that ye, being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. And came and preached peace to you which were afar off, and to them that were nigh. For through him we both have access by one Spirit unto the Father. Now, therefore, ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. Thus far we read God's holy and inspired words, may God add his blessing upon the reading of the Holy Scriptures. Beloved congregation in the Lord Jesus Christ, throughout the New Testament, the Holy Spirit uses several different figures to describe the relationship of the church as the church relates unto Jesus Christ. One figure that the Spirit uses in the New Testament is that of marriage. The church is likened unto the bride, and Jesus Christ is the groom, and the bride and the groom are knit together in marriage. This figure of marriage illustrates for us the intimacy of the relationship between Christ and the church, and as well indicates for us the care, and the tender affection that Jesus has toward the church. Another figure that the Holy Spirit uses in the New Testament is that of the head in comparison to the body. 
Jesus is the head and the church is the body. And this indicates as well the headship that Jesus has over the church, the submissiveness that the church owes unto Jesus Christ, her head, as well, again, the closeness of this union. There's there's no separation between the head and the body. But then another figure, and that, that we turn to this morning, that the Holy Spirit uses in the New Testament to illustrate for us the relationship between Christ and the church is the figure of a building, a structure. Jesus Christ is the foundation. And the church is the structure, the edifice, that is built upon that solid foundation. Anyone with the least level of familiarity with construction knows that there is a certain order in building a home. You don't start with the roof or the walls, but you start with the foundation. After the foundation has been completed, then you move on to the next steps of building the home. The text that we consider this morning sets forth that same progression for us in building a home. Verse 20 speaks of the foundation, built on the foundation. Verse 21 speaks of the actual construction of the home, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord. And then what's the final step? After the foundation is finished, after the home is built, then what do you do? You move in. You habitat that home. And that's verse 22. In whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. Let's consider this text this morning then under the theme, a building fitly framed. First, we'll consider her foundation. Second, her construction. Third, her habitation. According to verse 20, the church is built on a foundation. You, who are the household of God, at the end of verse 19, the household of God is built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Every carpenter, every homeowner knows the importance of a good foundation. The builder wants the foundation to be as sturdy as reasonably possible. If the foundation fails in any aspect, then it presents all sorts of problems for the people who live upon that foundation. In modern homes, if your foundation shifts, you might see evidence of that in cracked drywall door frames that are no longer square, but that start to lean out of square, and so your doors don't shut well anymore. There can be frost that pushes up from underneath the foundation and lifts the foundation up. But then as well, there's the weight of the home that presses down upon that foundation. And so a good foundation needs to be able to resist pressure from both ways. You don't want your foundation moving up with frost, but you also don't want your foundation shifting with the weight of the home or with the wind that presses against that home, having the home move off of the foundation. In a worst case scenario with the failure of a foundation, it leads to a total collapse. Jesus illustrated this with the figure of the two homes, one house built on the foundation of sand, the other house built on the foundation of rock, the house that was built upon the sand, when the winds came and beat against it, the children know, 
great was the fall of that home. How important, then, is a foundation? What, then, will be the foundation of the church? God's precious church, loved from all eternity, adopted the members of the church to be his own sons and daughters. What is worthy of serving as the foundation of his church? What is strong enough to resist all of the forces that would press against the church and seek to move the church from off her footings. The text tells us that the church is built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. When the text tells us that the foundation is built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, it is not telling us that the foundation is the apostles and the prophets, but it's the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. It's the foundation that comes from the apostles and the prophets. What then is this foundation that has its source in the apostles and the prophets? It's truth. The truth of Jehovah God himself. It serves as the foundation, the bedrock, upon which God's church is built up. We understand that the foundation is the foundation of truth when we understand what are apostles and what are prophets. Apostles. There are people who were commissioned, people who were sent out by Jesus Christ himself. Going where Jesus directed them to go, bringing the words that Jesus directed them to give. The Apostle Paul defends his own apostleship in Galatians 1 verse 1 where he writes, Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who hath raised him from the dead. And then a prophet, the meaning of that word prophet is one who bubbles over. It's like a pot on the stove with boiling water in it which cannot be contained. So the prophet, filled with the knowledge of God and the love of God and zeal for his holiness, cannot be contained but bubbles over with the will of Jehovah God. Both the apostle and the prophet then are directed by God to Make known unto the people of God what is the mystery of the kingdom of Jesus Christ. They go forth with a a, a heavenly and a divine commission, bringing the words of the kingdom of heaven unto the people of God. And so it is then that the apostles and the prophets were used by God to lay down the foundation of the church. Paul speaks of this in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians 3 verse 10. According to the grace of God which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I, Paul, have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth, Thereupon, Many different aspects of this one foundation were laid by the Apostle Paul and the other apostles and prophets. They laid down the foundational truth of the Trinity, that God is three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. 
They laid down the foundational truth of the, div- the divinity of Jesus Christ. That Jesus is not simply a prophet, not simply a teacher, not simply a good example or role model, but beyond that, Jesus Christ is God, as evidenced by His power and the miracles that He performed. The apostles and the prophets laid down the foundational truth of the humanity of Christ. Not only that He is God, that He was with God in the beginning, but also that Jesus Christ is flesh of our flesh and bone of our bone. They laid down the reality that Jesus Christ had a real human nature and thus was truly tempted in all points, like as we are yet without sin. They laid down that foundational truth that Jesus Christ is the one mediator between God and man. And that there is no other mediator who can be found in heaven above or in earth beneath but this man. He laid down that foundational truth and humbling truth of the sinfulness and depravity of man. Even earlier in this chapter, Paul himself testifying, And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. They lay down the foundational truth of the Holy Spirit who is the promised comforter who makes groanings for us which cannot be uttered. That's the foundation upon which God builds his church. But then the verse goes on in describing this foundation for us. You are built, verse 20, upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, the chief cornerstone of the foundation. Now in a sense, Jesus Christ is not merely the cornerstone of the foundation, but He is the whole foundation. He's not just part of the foundation, but He is every aspect of the foundation. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 speaks of that reality. We read the 10th verse earlier, now 1 Corinthians 3, verse 11. For for other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. There the apostle testifies that there is no other foundation than Jesus Christ. And so we may speak and do speak of Christ as the entire foundation. He is the beginning. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the beginning of any construction project is the foundation. He is the basis, the basis of man's salvation, just as a foundation is the basis of of the home. But this text in Ephesians speaks more specifically. It does not speak generally of Jesus Christ as being the foundation, though that is true. But Ephesians 3 verse 20 speaks of Jesus Christ as being a unique aspect of the foundation. It tells us that Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone. And so we must know something about what is this cornerstone. The cornerstone in uh, ancient building times was a vital aspect of the foundation. The cornerstone would be the very first stone that was set in place as part of the foundation. And so it was necessary that this cornerstone be 
aligned in precisely the right direction, for the rest of the foundation would go out from that cornerstone. In addition, it was necessary that this cornerstone have the necessary strength to be able to sustain the weight that would press upon it. For the rest of the foundation would be built out from this cornerstone. As well, this cornerstone would be oftentimes given a position of prominence and would be a larger stone than the other stones that were used to construct that foundation. And so that teaches us here about what Jesus Christ is as Jesus Christ stands in relation unto the church. Jesus Christ is that cornerstone which is laid first. Without the cornerstone, there is no church. But Jesus Christ is the most prominent one in the church. It's in Jesus Christ that the church is chosen. God adopted us, chose us in Jesus Christ. Christ, as the cornerstone, is perfectly fitted for the building that will be laid on top of that cornerstone. When an engineer puts together plans for the foundation of a home, that engineer, as he thinks about the foundation, must plan for that foundation anticipating what the final structure of the home is going to look like. How large will the home be? The home is going to cover a thousand square feet and the foundation must be appropriate to the size of that home. How much weight, how many tons are going to be pressing down upon that home or upon that foundation? Then the foundation must be built strong enough, thick enough, embedded in something sturdy enough that it can sustain the weight of that home. So before any board is put in place before any walls go up, the engineer is anticipating what the final structure will look like, designing that foundation appropriate to the home. In God's plan, the foundation that is suited perfectly to the needs of the church is Jesus Christ. Who is it that the church needs supporting her, directing her, being her rock in the midst of an ever-changing world? It's Christ, who is the chief cornerstone. Two applications that we make then about this foundation. First, we must not attempt to lay again the church's foundation. The text tells us that we are built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. To be sure, there is a calling that comes for us as we are involved in the building up and growing of this church. But the text does not tell us that we must lay the foundation Again, the foundation has been laid by Jesus Christ through the apostles and the prophets. The devil would tempt us at times to think that the foundation does need to be laid again. The devil would have us think along these lines that the church is corrupt. The church is rotten even to the depths of her core. The church has become compromised. The church has fallen off of her foundations, and so some would say that it's necessary then to take out the jackhammer and tear apart the foundation and start over with the church. The Word of God tells us we're built upon 
the foundation. The foundation in Jesus Christ is perfect. This is not to say that there are no imperfections in the church. There are. The church is filled with many sins and weaknesses. But let us not accuse the foundation for weaknesses that are found in the structure. Second application that arises out of this instruction here about the foundation is this. Let us study the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. If this is the bedrock upon which Jesus Christ is pleased to build up his church, then let us know of these foundational truths. Let us be students of the apostles and the prophets. Ignorance of the foundational truths of God's word leads to so many problems in the home, in the church, in the school, and in society at large. Pray that God give unto you a spirit of wisdom and knowledge so that you might grow in the grace and knowledge of God. Understanding then what the foundation is, The inspired writer moves on to speak of the construction of this building. Verse 21, In whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord. He begins by speaking here of all the building. All the building. In whom all the building fitly framed together. And all the building is a reference here to all of the many different parts components that make up this building. When a construction worker begins building a, a home, he must gather all of the material that is needed for that home. And so there is a stack of two by fours, and there is the siding, and there is the drywall, and there are the shingles, there's the nails, there are the screws, the glue that is going to be used to put together this home. When the carpenter begins the work of assembling this home, at first, it is not even recognizable as a home. A child might drive by with mother and father in the vehicle and see the pile of materials laying at the job site and ask, what is this, mom and dad? And mom and dad will then have to explain that this is the site of a future home, but it is not identifiable until at last, the found, after the foundation is laid, then the walls go up, and then the roof is put on top, and more and more that the, the raw materials are formed into the home. Well, so it is then in the church of Jesus Christ. All the building must be fitly framed together. All of the pieces of the spiritual building which make up the church are the people. You and I are all of, or a part of, all of the building. There is great diversity in the church. All of the different members of the church are to be fitly framed together. At first glance, looking at all of the people of the church, they are not recognizable as a unified whole. At first, when looking at the church, there are so many differences, so many things that would separate the church and cause division in the church that it does not at all resemble a building fitly framed together. I enjoy myself doing some woodworking as a hobby. I have found personally one of the most difficult parts of woodworking is the joinery. 
How do you take these two boards and join them together? It's especially difficult trying to use traditional woodworking methods. If it's difficult to join two boards together which are uniform in size, how much more difficult is it not to frame together the church of the New Testament? How is it possible to take rich and poor, black and white, Jew and Gentile, male and female, powerful and weak, and join, fitly frame, all of these people together. Humanly speaking, we would say it is impossible to join all of these people together so that they are and appear as a unified whole. The reason for division and separation in the church is sin. It's because of our nature, which does not love, but rather has enmity toward one another, that by nature it would be impossible for the church to be fitly framed together. But what is impossible with man is possible with God. The power of God by which he fitly frames, unites his church together, is the power of truth. You are built, he declares in the 20th verse, you are built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. That's how God takes those who by nature are so different one from another, who have so many natural differences, and God brings them and unites them together as one body. It's on the basis of truth. The church is built in Jesus Christ. Twice The text mentions the connection that we have with Christ. Verse 21, in whom, and the whom refers to Christ, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord. And again in verse 22, in whom, Jesus Christ the Lord, you are also builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. As God builds up his church, God is always gathering his church upon the foundation. Where is the church found? Where do we see the New Testament church? It's always to be found on the basis of truth. Where truth is proclaimed. Where truth is revealed by God. That is where the church is gathered and built up. And so always then the church must stand for truth, guard the truth, love the truth, and seek to defend truth against all heresies that otherwise would creep into the church. Built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. Because God, to this present day, is actively building up His church. And because God will continue building up His church until the return of Jesus Christ on the clouds of glory, that means then that the church is changing. It means that there's a transformation that's happening in the church. Earlier, the church was made up of disconnected people. All of the members of the church were there in God's counsel and in God's mind, but the members of the church were not yet fitly framed together. 
It is in time, as, as in, in the passing of time, that God gathers unto himself that church. And so that means then that the church is not stagnant. The church is not the same, but the church is growing as God builds up the church. It does not always appear to be sure that the church is growing. The church does not always grow in the same way that we would want the church to grow. God does not always incorporate into the body of Jesus Christ those whom we wish would be included in the body of Jesus Christ. But by faith we believe that the church is growing. And we who are God's people then must love the fact And we do love the fact that the church is being built. We would not want the church to be stagnant. To remain always the same. A Christian must not be resistant unto all change in the church. But there is such a thing as a healthy change. There's also an unhealthy change. It takes wisdom to discern between the two. Is this a positive reformation of the church? Or is this an attack on the foundation of the church? It takes wisdom to know the difference between the two. How can we How can we discern whether a change is for good or for evil? Whether a change is healthy for the body or unhealthy for the body? The text gives us a standard that can be used. And that standard is facing this question. Will this change bring us closer Unto the foundation of the church? Or will this change bring us away from the foundation of the church? So we said twice over the text speaks of the fact that the church is built up in connection with Christ, in whom all the building fitly framed together. So as we face changes and have proposals for changes, that standard must be applied. Will this bring us closer unto the foundational truths of God's word? Or will these changes bring us further away from Christ? And if it is the case that changes in church or in the home bring us closer unto God, then we must not resist those changes. Children, that means if dad makes a rule prohibiting you from doing something worldly on Sunday. Maybe earlier you could do this or that, but now dad says no. We're not going to do that because it's not honoring to God. And that means you must not resist that change, but receive it. As dad uses that change to seek to bring the home closer to the foundation of Jesus Christ. One question, does it bring us closer to the foundation? The second question, as we evaluate any proposed changes, will this bring us closer unto the other members of the body. First question, will it bring us closer to Christ? Second question, will it bring us closer to the other members of the body? The text emphasizes the unity of the church. We are fitly framed together. Verse 22, in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. And so that standard must be applied then. Will this decision impact the unity of the church? Is this decision going to help 
promote fellowship among the members of God's church. But always according to the will and the power of God, the church grows. He builds it up as his own habitation. Verse 22, in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. What's amazing about that 22nd verse? It's this thought. God builds up the structure of the church. So that he can dwell in it. The primary purpose of God building up the church, the structure of the church, is not so that you and I can live in it. Though that is an incredible and an amazing thought as well. But according to this 22nd verse, the purpose for which God builds up the church is so that he can habitat it. One's habitation is their residence. It's their primary residence. Of all the places that God could choose to reside, God has chosen the church to be his Holy dwelling place. It's not as if God lacked a home. It's not as if God had nowhere else to go. If he would hungry grow, he would not tell us. Because the earth and all that is therein already belongs unto God. And yet God chose you who are the members of the church, to be his habitation. You. This is your home. As God dwells with you in the church. Notice the personal language used in verse 22. The first person in whom ye also, you also, are builded together for an habitation of God. He is not here speaking generally of the truth that the church is inhabited by people, but he is speaking specifically of you. You are builded together for God's habitation. You, who have been chosen by God, you, who have been redeemed with the blood of God's only begotten Son, you, who are called out of darkness and into God's marvelous light, you, who have been given the gift of faith, who are built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, You are the habitation of God. May that thought comfort you in your afflictions. May that thought be used to exhort you unto greater faithfulness in the service of the Lord. And may that thought humble you so that you might worship him who is all in all. Amen. Let us pray. Our Father which art in heaven, we thank thee for Jesus Christ, thy Son, who is ascended up on high and led captivity captive, and who gives gifts unto men. We thank thee for the gift of apostles and prophets, We thank thee for the foundation laid by them. Now, Father, wilt thou work in us personally that we might be built up 
as members of thy holy church. Wilt thou forgive us our sins, preserve us by thy grace. For Jesus' sake we pray this. Amen.